Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, we have to get moving. Um, the announcement I made earlier about announcing the video, I'll do at the end of this session because we need to get uh, rolling on this session because welcome to the very first ever GateCon live stream to the world through our friends at MGM. Um, and we're going to do this with a, a pretty cool panel as well. Um, we're going to bring our system lords on stage, so could everyone please welcome Dean Ellsworth, Jacqueline Samuda, Ale Alex Alexis Cruz, Douglas Arthurs and Peter Williams. Good to be back. You remember me? I'm the guy that does all the hugs, so who, who, who wants a hug? <laughs> He's, Get too consent. He's too up. <laughs> Go ahead, eat up a few more minutes. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'm just hugging. Huh? He's filibusting. That's it, yes. Ooh. Meanwhile, we're going to decide who gets the first verse. <laughs> right? Yeah, Sorry, well, kids. No, that's fine. This is no, not no, a democracy, no, you, you, you and I am a couple. god. <laughs> Aw. Who is, who is it? He's a teddy bear. Who said I'm he's a, a bad guy? I'm a very shy teddy bear. <laughs> that's it. Will somebody please count the chest hairs? Just that's a nice. There's none. Yeah, it's like no, the top yeah. of his head. Same, same. <laughs> it's just, Dougie missed our meet and greet. He just wanted to make sure he got in touch with our audience. Well done, sir. Yeah. Does How's that mean everybody? there's there's a question for the person holding mic number one, or that's the first question? Paddle one. Paddle one. This is the first question. I think that answered my question. You know it. Hi, a question to everybody. How cool is it to be bad? I'm sorry, was that in English? How cool How is cool? it to be bad? It's about it's... fifty-three degrees. <laughs> <laughs> I give a moderate temperature of It's super cool to be bad. It's always more fun to be bad, in my opinion, because there's always layers and layers and layers of subtext. So you play the surface, and often you're actually quite innocent. Your intentions are to achieve your goal, and just because your goal happens to involve, say, decimating an entire planet or hurting a the delightful teenage girl, you know, you actually have a goal in mind that you think is worth pursuing and so you're innocent on that level and then there's all the layers underneath so it's i love it i'm going to paraphrase the question how cool is it to be back <laughs> frankly i'm really happy to be back and it's great to be here at gatecon big up gatecon yes sir yes sir Cheers. yes sir that's what i thought the question one is was as well which which was how glad are you to be back here um but how glad was i to be bad yes Yes, uh, <laughs> I enjoyed the heck, the heck out of it. Um, I, see, I watched my words right there. And uh, for, for the same reasons that Jacqueline just mentioned, is that the layers just come off so easily um, and, 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 and can be performed in such an innocent way that you don't even know you're doing it. But I want to do this, and this is why. And it, it can, yeah, it's, it can come off as evil. <laughs> or at least I do. I, I was... I was I'm going to build on that, but, I, but I'm also going to pivot because I was sort of in a, in a unique situation where I had to play good and bad in the same body. Uh, so for me, it was my measure of badness was in direct relation to Scara's measure of goodness. And for me, that's where the weaving and the interest came into. So whatever layer was taken off one person was put onto the next and vice versa. And it would... You know, so I, I sort of had to, to calculate that accordingly. Can you explain that a little more? Like when you say whatever layer was taken off? Right, so, so Scara was, when I first created Scara, he was designed to be, from the ground up, the quintessential uh, ingenue archetype. The, the go west young man, go out across the threshold, right? All of those things. And so the challenge there was how do I make that interesting for an audience that thinks they know what good guys are about? Right, and between the, the outside context of his people being oppressed 
and finding out these new allies, and he has to go up against his god for all intents and purposes, and, and ultimately end up destroying them. What does that do to one's culture? What is that, right? How do you choose goodness in the face of potentially uh, bad things that you have to do along the way, bad things that your enemy is doing? Which one is worse, right? All these questions that are relevant today. Uh, so when Chlorel came around, everything was in juxtaposition to those things, and that's how I was able to find my landmarks, right, for the bad guy, was yeah. what is the opposite of Skara. Uh, and so the same way I had to make all those pin, pinpoints interesting for Skara, I had to do that for Chlorel uh, in relation. And, and then back to what you said about to making them, because no person, no creature, necessarily thinks it's all bad. It's doing it in the pursuit of its own justifications, right? Whatever its moral center is. Uh, so getting into that, except with, with me, I had constantly uh, a schizophrenia happening, whereas like you guys could just go into your bad guy. My bad guy had a good guy voice on his shoulder messing with him. And my good guy had a bad guy voice on his shoulder <laughs> messing with him. The whole time. I want one of those. Oh, it was wanted. great fun. Kind of, kind of human I mean, Nirji oh. was just like, you know, it's all in the interests of science. So right. there was no real moral compass. It was all about science and the pursuit of, of you know, creating the absolute perfect Hoktar. And anyway, yeah, this stuff gets deep. It yeah, gets people deep, y'all. It makes you human is what, what I saw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the most human character. I, yeah. Right, right there. Yeah. I was going to say, your schizophrenia sounded more like quadrophenia, but that's a whole different <laughs> thing. <laughs> Apophis, I, I saw Apophis as a two-dimensional, uh, grand cartoon character. Um, uh, it, it, uh, it's morphed a little bit in the 20 years since I've actually played Apophis, and um, now I just continue being bad on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a lot of competition on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but we were told not to go there. That, this is right. Yeah. That's right. No, I thought it was swearing. <laughs> That's it's the just other T word. But I mean, uh, how many uh, gods are there on Twitter compared to you? There you go. Apophis. I'll always be number one. And speaking always. of number one. Yeah. <laughs> so this is for anyone who, who wants to answer it. I mean, obviously, you know, the gold voice, the glowing eyes were all done in post. But has there ever been a situation or can you think of a situation in everyday life where you wish you could just pull out that voice and the glowing eyes just to get something, you know, your way? Uh, coming up here from home uh, in uh, Cole Harbor in the traffic, I could use it. <laughs> I don't have to use the voice, man. Things just happen for me the way they're supposed to. And I'll give you a little example. This morning I came down to Starbucks for my coffee. I'm standing there and the lineup wasn't very long. There were two girls in front of me. And um, they were haggling over something with the uh, cashier. And then they turned around to me and they said, do you want anything? And I went, excuse me? Do I want anything? Well, this is what happens to God. See, people want to give you stuff. <laughs> they, 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 offer. they offer. <laughs> they, they, pa offer. they make offerings, exactly. <laughs> Turns out these two girls just got off an Air Japan flight Something had happened on the flight, so they were compensated with all these vouchers. They had a $50 voucher at Starbucks, and they couldn't spend it. So they turned around and offered it to the god. A lot of cappuccinos. As one does. Yeah. Fitting, fitting. And in my case, I, the glowing eyes, are, they're just very cool, and the voice is also very cool, but I wish I could just... Invisibility, like that. <laughs> Preferably with a nice piece of sidearm, you know, and just... That's my it. fantasy, too. <laughs> Wait, which one of us is invisible? <laughs> <laughs> well, we if we're both Here invisible, we that just raises Don't all kinds of possibilities. Okay. <laughs> These are words I'm not allowed to We've use. We've known each other a long time. Yeah, as you can tell. Um, every time I walk into a casting office. <laughs> Give me the role. <laughs> just as long as you don't feel invisible in the casting yeah, office. Yeah, no. Uh, speaking to creditors, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't so much have the glowing eyes, but it's, it's pretty much I what? Yeah, so yeah, things like that are quite yeah, yeah. But that's really the only manifest. 
I like Peter's, uh, yeah, because there are there are moments when you know when recognized for anything that we may or may not have done that uh, that is the, the, I think the may not may not exactly <laughs> Got where, where those, you might yeah. have to say uh yeah no here's my resume I was and I did that and yeah. Aren't you the guy from mm, yeah. no I had a lot of makeup me, on okay. yeah <laughs> exactly yeah no but I like that manifesting it yeah. That God like something. And people, people just want to see you in things. You know how many times I have had people recently go, hey, I just saw you in that real estate commercial. They really huh? want to see you. <laughs> it, it wasn't oh, you. That's wasn't news you. for me. No. <laughs> Reminds me of a book. This just come out. I think it's called Fear. This is, it wasn't me. Oh, I'm sorry. We're not allowed to talk about that. Yeah, again. Sorry. Oh. Where's that next question? Anybody? Who's holding the number one sign? Oh, there's a question. My question's for Alexis. Yeah. Um, you have been with the Stargate franchise from pretty much day one. Yep. Can, and I don't know if you've told this story before, but can you talk about your experience of being with us from the beginning? Uh, sure. Well, I was the uh, first actor on set for the first day of filming, I was the last actor on the last scene of the last day of filming. Oh, oh so nice, nice days. Little bookend. Uh, and it was, it was wonderful because uh, uh, at the time, I'd, I'd been a working actor for a while. I was a child actor. I started when I was nine years old. And um, at the, around the time when I auditioned for Stargate, uh, I hadn't been working for it. It had been about a year. Uh, where I hadn't booked anything, and at that time in my life, I was like, what's going on with my career? What's happening, right? Uh, my agent called me, he goes, okay, well, I've got this audition for you, but it's, it's for a, a low-budget, independent sci-fi movie, and you'd only have three lines in it, and they're not in English, so <laughs> you, uh, I, I think you should pass, Alexa. You know, I, I'm obligated to bring you the offer, but uh, you should pass, because it's, it's, it, you're better than this. And of course, I, was, I hadn't worked, so I was like, no, no, I have, I'm going to go and do it anyway. Uh, let me audition for it. Uh, and I was in school, so like all, everything was fresh in, from my acting school. So I go in for the audition, uh, and it was pretty much all pantomime, right? And, uh, and I guess I knocked it out of the park. Uh, uh, they called me back. I met Dean and Roland. We hit it off immediately, and everything just happened right away. Next thing I know, they're flowing me out, flying me out to LA for a screen test, uh, which that's what they did back then. Yeah. Um, you know, back in, in 1900 BC. Now you have to fly yourself. <laughs> <laughs> or self-tape. Yeah. And it slowly just got unraveled and bigger and bigger before my very eyes. So I, we did the, the audition again for them. And Dean's walking me around the art studio and the art department and the wardrobe department. And it's just, I see all the designs and the, the creature effects. And it, it's just bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm like, what? Since when was this a low-budget indie <laughs> film? Um, technically, it was because it didn't have any studio Hollywood m m uh, money. It was all uh, Kuroko uh, in France. Uh, Canal Plus and Kuroko putting uh, it together. Uh, so technically, independently. And it was at the time when... Uh, nobody put this much money into an independent film before, uh, but Roland indeed had come off of Universal Soldier, which had done really, really well, and, uh, and this was going to be a trilogy. So once everything went through, then I showed up, and uh, it was originally for three films. It was a three-film deal. It was going to be like Star Wars. Uh, so I eagerly signed up, and, and it was just with fantastic. The two, Everybody it was, a, it was a happy family the entire way through. It was, it was hard work, but we knew that we were creating something really special. And your three-line part, like how many? It turned into three hours. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it just got bigger and bigger. Um, because they really trusted their cast. They, they, Dean and Roland, once they selected us, uh, they just trusted our work. And we were able to fill in all of the life that was necessary there, and, uh, particularly with the language. Right, so this was actual ancient Egyptian that we were learning, and we were uh, brought a uh, an Egyptologist whose life's work was, or at that time, was vocalizing this dead language that nobody speaks anymore. There was probably only like 20, 30 people in the world even doing this work. Uh, so in working with us, we were able to fill in a key component to that work, which was this 
live laboratory of working with actors who understand communication, breathing, context, right? All of these things that the, uh, the so academics... you were allowed to flow with all the improvisation and everything, just go what, crazy. Was that? With all the improvisation, you could just... And they would check and yeah, see exactly, what Yeah, exactly, exactly. We yeah. could just build on stuff as, as we improvised, yeah. And the academics hadn't really considered that part of it. Uh, so, and at 19, young actor, I always questioned, you know, well, what we do isn't rocket science, right? It's not brain surgery. What are we actually giving to the world? Uh, which were things that I was concerned with. And that experience answered that question for me because we were able to really add to the anthropological record, to the anthropological body of knowledge, as we discovered the life of these ancient Egyptians and how they moved and how they walked and talked and where certain vowel sounds were pronounced this way and not that way and consonants this way and not that way, how we shortened the letters. So Eric, myself, and Mile would sit around talking in ancient Egyptian in between. Did you understand each other? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Now granted, there was, you know, there's a lot less vocabulary in 3000 BC than now. <laughs> so, you know, contextually it was kind of limited, but between that and, again, our body language, which we threw into it, that's everything a very, became uh, clear. Yeah, that's a very cool element, and characters like, like all the Goa'uld and, and, you know, some of the other alien characters on Stargate, the TV franchise, the physicality is a very key component. And the, th the fact that you were doing th that at that age, I think was, was perfect because I remember coming out of um, acting school, university, and the physical work that you did every single day really kept that instrument toned. And as we age as actors, sometimes that gets put aside a little bit because we're working more with just conventional dialogue in normal rooms and it's not necessarily as raw and fresh but to have an opportunity like for example you know the the characters that we played on the TV franchise there there was an element of physicality that was special and and kind of you know not arch but not just ordinary and that's unique. just such a yeah unique yeah, that's just such a great opportunity and and also had some real challenges because obviously some people are wearing costumes that are you know they're coming from historical fact for example um you his costume was so r realistic that it was stiff and in the old days those characters those those people those royal people had to use a little tiny stool that was basically about six inches by three inches and then it was on a cane and they had to put it up their skirt and just lean against it and that's what he had to do <laughs> because there was no way to sit down i had a throne <laughs> i had a throne or at least too. we told yeah, we were told throne. there was a stool the throne, throne worked for me just before we go to the next question i just want to augment what you said the uh, the um the the whole uh, academic side of the language spilled over from the movie into that Children of the Gods pilot that we started on. It might have fallen away by the end, but we had a, we had a, a UBC professor who was an Egyptologist on set during Children of the Gods giving us instruction. And most certainly, this has not ever been taken lightly. I don't think you know. I mean, when we're when we're talking about the consultants and the people involved and have been involved from the very beginning, yeah, it's truly, yeah, it it, it is academic, and 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 that's a pretty deep question to ask yourself at nineteen. You know, what exactly am I doing this for? So, yeah, it's always been a, a question I wanted to know. Like, what are you guys yeah. doing this for? Well, thankfully, those good answers have been continually reinforced throughout my life. Good. In my career, yeah. That arm is getting tired. <laughs> Go for it. Hi, Dean. I'm Dean. Hey, uh, you played Anubis, correct? I did, too. Um, uh, when you played and voiced Anubis, did you, or to any of you, did you feel like the power that you could do anything and order anyone to do anything? We're, we're actors. I'm not sure how much power you feel when you're on set. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Depending if you're number one or number two after th three or four years, then you get a bit more power. I was most certainly about to say exactly that. Uh, to digress, to... It was... And, and you know, I know that we're probably going to hear this a lot, but it was Peter DeLuise who... Um, he just... I, th I 
he, he wanted me to lighten up, really. It's like, because I was like, you know, all this. Um, and so he cracked me up. He loosened me up. And, um, and so I, I, you may have seen a, a much more rigid um, character um, had it not been for our uh, illicit uh, director. Yeah, I think he did a, a great job of just molding that for that very moment. And I was very lucky to be in the hands of, of, of such a great director. I had a great time by, by doing that. I embodied the, what I thought was the, the, the earthly, you know, in, incarnation of a king as the only thing I could really, you know, deal with. And so that's how I, 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 I did it. But I certainly liked the, the level of, um, yeah, there was that little thing, you know, that goes up your spine and kind of, you know, runs through the ends of your fingers and lights up your eyes even if you don't have it through post-production. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it does happen. I remember Peter, um, I guess it was fair game before, was it fair game? Help me. Where I go, I'm going back into the, going back through the gate after I kind of help Cassandra. And uh, I have a moment where I'm talking to, uh, to RDA. And Peter just said, milk it, milk it. <laughs> and it was just so fun to, to be given that permission just to really kind of take your time and sit in the moment and yeah, feel be that, that power. Yeah. And I also really enjoyed um, torturing Amanda. That was <laughs> awesome. And, and what, was, what was fun about that was just to, to allow myself, because, of this, because the set was so great and everybody was really part of a unit, we mm -hmm. all felt that way. So even as a guest performer, I felt very welcomed and mm. just I could just be grounded mm -hmm. and do my work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just really got to relax. So to be powerful but not tense and just relax and sit in it, that was super fun. <laughs> right? Yeah. I think the most powerful I ever felt on set was that very first entrance in Children of the Gods. It just didn't get any more powerful than that for me, uh, despite whoever I tortured or killed or <laughs> mated with. <laughs> Power is when you can have Michael Shanks. Speaking of people I killed. Kneel before your God. Uh, Remember yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, for me, it was just coming out of the sarcophagus, right? So like, I had people kneeling before I got up for breakfast. <laughs> Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> so with all of the evil technology and stuff that you guys worked with, what would you think would be your favorite piece of technology to actually have, like, in the real world today? The, the hand, invisibility. of course. Yeah. <laughs> all that power there. <laughs> yeah, the, river, the, the ribbon device for me, yeah. I, I, I got, I think, it, I forget which episode it was now, I, um, uh, I can't remember now, I, was, I engaged in some kind of, I, I never got to use the staff weapon just that once, it's only that once, and I, uh, I really enjoyed firing that off, because, you know, they, I got to sh point it at everybody and create some explosions, and, um, you know, it survived on YouTube, that scene, there's a scene on YouTube with me wielding this thing and, you know, just flashing it around and, Blowing shit up. St <laughs> I mean, stuff up. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a second, five, five second delay. They can change that. <laughs> Besides, that word is the same in all languages around the world. I didn't say it. <laughs> I'm you allowed. Were waiting for me to say it, weren't you? <laughs> waiting for me to. Besides, I think you've already seen a Christopher Judge panel. There must have been something <laughs> like that. How, what happened? <laughs> yeah, they were using that delay like every five yeah. seconds, <laughs> recutting a whole new panel. I kind of went, well, I, I don't recall Anubis ever using technology. Is it, please correct me if that's the case, but yeah. Is that, what happened? No? He did? It's all tech. I like that, whatever that was. 
Go ahead, next question. Hey, this is a question for all of you. Hey. Uh, Alex, I noticed you were wearing a Ravenclaw shirt, which I got am. me wondering, did each of you have an interest in sci-fi and fantasy before you worked in Stargate, or did your work in Stargate kind of introduce you to some more sci-fi and fantasy elements? Yeah, I was always a geek. Always, always uh, sci-fi, fantasy, all time. I ran my first Dungeons and Dragons game on my 15th birthday. Yeah. It was a weekend sleepover with my buddies. Uh, we were just sort of figuring out. And before, we, before I bought the D&D set, we started on Marvel Super Heroes, the role-playing game, because they were both, it was the, the D&D Red Box set, and they were both at, at the comic book store, but of course we were terrified of the D&D set because we were told that the devil would come and take our souls and all that stories. stuff, right? Oh, yeah, but the Marvel stories. superheroes game was right next to it in a Safe. yellow box, and we were like, Marvel wouldn't steal our souls? <laughs> Let's play that. We started that in the, in the cafeteria of <laughs> our middle school, and it just went on from there. So yeah, everything sci-fi, comics. Um, uh, I produced and created a uh, graphic novel uh, a few years ago. I have a few of them here for sale Yay. as well. I brought with me. You can check that out. Um, so uh, I'm well connected with the comics and just comp constantly follow it, still do. So yeah, I'm, I'm all about it before it got really popular. I'm a hipster that way. Uh, and I always said, you know, I always knew that, uh, that, that you know, they always said that deals are made on the golf course. And I said, watch, it's going to change, and the deal's going to be made in the comic stores. And I was proven correct. That's cool. Yeah. I, I really liked Narnia. <laughs> I, yeah, I, just, I was really, really into Narnia. And um, as for sci-fi, uh, it was my favored, you know, as a, a beginning writer, I found that my ideas were just generally, I'm so interested in quantum physics and science, and so my, my story ideas tended to be sci-fi, which is why it was so fun to contribute to Metamorphosis, and the whole DNA kind of machine was, was my, uh, was part of my pitch. I cut my eye teeth, I guess, on the original Star Trek. Um, I will confess to only ever having seen one of the Star Wars franchise. <gasps> And that's and that's the and that's the first Impossible. one. Impossible. <laughs> no, really, I uh, I might have seen two. My may, may have been the sequel, the second one, but I never saw any anything further. And um, uh, I I just by that point I had um, I had disavowed myself of the knowledge that I was going to be a geek. I um, I didn't become one until I met all of y'all. Um, <laughs> Over and over, and Talk now I power. now I proudly I self-identify, as does <laughs> as does everyone else here. <laughs> that we are on a on a unabashedly nerds. I was just into Archie comics. Sorry. <laughs> Archie. Have you been on Riverdale? No, not yet. No, not yet, no. I, I don't get the daddy parts. So no, there's a lot of daddy parts. On yeah. <laughs> I found myself enamored with uh, with uh, with sci-fi, but only later I had I had began first my 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 I guess viewing um, with with films and and all of the black and whites from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and just that was all. It, and my first 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 outing was a strange show. I don't know if you ever remember it, but I think it was called Space 1999 or something. Yes! Yeah. And it affected me. There was this creature. This creature that had like this throbbing brain on this. It was, and the, and the actors were reacting to it, and they were real. As real as those actors in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s films that I'd seen before. And uh, yeah, no, it really affected me. It affected me in such a way that I, I wanted to pursue, um, uh, you know, a part in that kind of universe—a universe that is taken seriously and that we're having a good time in, and and learning to relax and not take ourselves too seriously in, but but is 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 cerebral and is 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 motivational and brings you know some some light and some darkness, but really you know suspends that disbelief and uh, yeah, so that's kind of where sci-fi has taken me. But yeah, it didn't start early, early. Yeah. 
Something else I like too, I just have to mention it, is Thunderbirds. Anybody remember Thunderbirds? Thunderbirds, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, so some of those anim early animations uh, really turned me on too. And, uh, and um, the uh, Back to the Future franchise yeah. was also cool. Well, you know. Of course, the Frank Miller stuff. I mean, come on. Beautiful stuff. Go ahead. I'd like to go back to the costuming. Um, my favorite costume was Nerti's in Rites of, uh, Rite of Passage. What, how did you guys feel? You know, what was your favorite costumes and what did you um, like about those? Christina McQuarrie, um, sat, gone too soon, absolute genius costumer. And um, for me, coming from theater, going into the wardrobe department that very first day, I was just taken back to working at the Shaw Festival and seeing absolute artists at the tables creating these things and looking at the sketches. Just absolutely incredible. And so the very first costume that I wore, people who've seen me speak at, at cons before would know, but there's a, a bejeweled panel on the front of the um, sort of cropped top. And it, it was actual semi-precious stones. And she, she said, I know I can say it now, but she said, shh, this little piece of fabric was $400 because <laughs> it was just this little bib and it was absolutely stunning. And because it was, it was actual stones, it gave a weight to the wardrobe that actually made a difference to my character as soon as I put it on. It was just absolutely amazing. So I loved that one. And then also for, um, for the movie, oh my goodness, um, Continuum. The uh, costume there, they first outfitted me in a muslin, which, which they do for, for big theater, big films, and so on. They build the costumes, because they're very expensive pieces and very involved, and they do it in a muslin, like a simple cotton first. And when I tried on the muslin dress, it was so gorgeous, I asked if I could please have it, and they laughed. They were like, ha, 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 oh no, because then, of course, they take it apart and use it as the pattern, but I was like, please, it's beautiful. So uh, anyway, I, every single piece of wardrobe that I put on um, designed by that genius Christina McQuarrie, I, I was, felt very grateful to be in that position. I got a bigger up too. She, um, she uh, I like to think I was her favorite. <laughs> and in fact, there is a book out there which has a quote from her. She really, she, she said something very nice about her uh, experience working on Apophis's outfits. Um, it just struck me that I had so many different outfits on, uh, on Stargate over the years. The only one I wasn't proud of was the gray drab thing I had in Continuum. Oh. Yeah. Oh. But um, if anybody can um, do a quick uh, recollection of how many costumes I had on Stargate, I'd appreciate that for anecdotes for future panels. <laughs> Thank you. I was, uh, oh, go ahead, Dougie. Uh, wearing uh, what he what Huey wore. I, I like to call him Huey instead of Herbert. <laughs> Huey. Um, it felt for me, let me know, working with in that, it was all plastic, of course, uh, but uh, you could walk around and such, but everything it felt like a big diaper for me. <laughs> Just, there wasn't a lot of movement that you could do, and everything had to be very stoic, which worked for the character and everything. It did work for that and everything. Um, wearing it for 12-hour days, it gets a little sweaty, as I'm sure Apophis would say about his stuff and everything. Oh, I, but, my, my and it was heavy, uh, heavy plastic and everything. So, yeah, it was a little bit difficult. Um, we, was, we were talking about, uh, about exactly that, the costume. Um, and Anubis' costume was quite elaborate and beautiful. It was big Japanese-style pants that... Like they, they just and like oh and, I, and you'd walk and, poof, and, poof, and I had these big boots right and this these pants were just so lovely and 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 made with such love and I, I could you could wear them for eons and they would never break down these pants and then this 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 cloak that she gave me and I was just oh my goodness so yeah it was just and and yeah to sort of to have that conversation out there and then to sort of yeah it's kind of neat. I, I loved it. I loved that that costume, but never saw it ever since. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had three costumes, right? My uh, Tatooine Scara. Uh, 
What's that? <laughs> uh, uh, Chlorel's one dress. Uh, and then the in-between scar, what, what I call the fighter soldier scar, right, with his uh, soldier wear and the vest. And that was, for me, my favorite costume. I liked that transitional one the most. I had the most freedom with it. It was the one where I actually had uh, a voice in deciding and choosing it um, and, and piecemealing that together, which is where I saw the character going. The other two, I didn't really have, I didn't have a say in that. Uh, the wardrobe designer on the film already had his concept, uh, just put me in it. Oh, there you go. Okay, great. And then the same uh, on SG-1. I, when they created uh, Chlorel, I didn't even know that this was going to be a thing. I found out about Chlorel on the van ride from Vancouver Airport to my hotel uh, when I got here. And I'm reading through the script. What are we doing? This way? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, just threw me for a little. I'm a bad guy now. Freaked me out. Uh, but one of the things that helped for me was that costume in that, um, you know, while it, I, I don't think it was really relevant that, because Alexis wasn't really comfortable in it, but Chlorel was. And so that helped me set some rails when I got there of, of understanding what the showrunners were, were thinking uh, to let me sort of slide into that character a little bit more, um, some boundaries, some parameters, and that he was, he didn't have to move much because he's a system lord. He has all of that power with just a flick of his finger, That's right? That's so it. So movement is not necessary at all. Just the slightest rustle technology. echoes to the room. So I had to play with that and get into that. And that was very different from Skara, who has a whole different philosophy and his way of being and how he moves around. So that all led me to thinking about power. It goes back to that other question, and what is power amongst the good guys and the bad guys? And how does everybody exercise that power differently to accomplish their goals. So that was my three. Go for it. Young lady at the back, no? Over there, okay. Stand out of the light. I see. Can I hold that? Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, Dean mentioned earlier, uh, coast, um, is that Space 99? I have to apologize. I have braces and, <laughs> and the pallet piece, so I'm, I'm, I'm mentally I'm okay. Okay, <laughs> just so you know. All right. Um, You're doing great. Yeah, thank, thank you, my lord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dean, you mentioned um, Space 1999. Yes. And it is with sadness that uh, I like to tell you that um, Xenia Merton passed away yesterday. Oh, no. Um, and that yesterday was September 13th, right? Hmm. 1999. Wow. I was here. <laughs> anyway, I have, it's a question for um, Anubis, who actually make me cry. I told them yesterday a lot when he passed away, too. Your body language in the TV show um, had a lot to do with me liking you, the way you were bored you um, uh, deal with uh, Skara in the um, uh, uh, scene where he's in this, inside the, um, uh, what do you call it, the, um, the sarcophagus, sorry, thank you. Sarcophagus. Sarcophagus. And it's the way you move this way, and then you turn like that way, but your head is like, you like hip hop dancing, you know? <laughs> Was it part of your character to move a certain way like this? with your shoulders straight and then only your head moving? Or was it because of the costumes? <laughs> Did you guys notice that, how the, it moves? No, I, you know, I have to say, I, mean, I want to answer your question with the same complexity that I think that I'm hearing from the rest of the panels, which is to take it seriously. It, we embody, at least I like to embody the character as says, godly as he was at the time and and so my movements were only limited to the universe that I was in and the universe that was being ruled for me at that point in time was by my director and so any movement any expression that I wished to share um, would not have been on screen had it not been for his uh, um, motivation I, I yeah I, I think that uh, Definitely, that body language went on the throne and went in 
transient. Um, yeah, it was it was part of the character. Yeah, and, but I believe conveyed and communicated through our director. Yeah. <laughs> Is that all right? right there? How are we doing, guys? All right. We have a question back here. I I put them to sleep. Number two. Um, hi, this is for all of you except for Alexis because you played both the Goa World and its host. But for the rest of you guys, have you ever wondered or thought about the hosts for the Goa World that you were playing? Ahem. <laughs> have you watched season two? <laughs> Serpent Song, two word answer to your question. Yes. Definitely. It was all about my host. <laughs> it was a beautiful episode. Beautiful. beautiful I'm very proud of that episode. Uh, As you should be, yes. I tell you what. By the panel tomorrow, you will have watched that episode, and, you, <laughs> and I will ask you the question. <laughs> Sorry to embarrass you. Uh, this Anyone is for else? Alexis. Um, I, know, I hope this is okay to ask about, uh, obviously, uh, Roland and Dean had one vision that they didn't get to pursue after the movie, and then there was all the, the motion like they might get to sort of wipe the slate clean and, and go back to their trilogy recently, and then that didn't happen. Um, you and Eric got to see kind of both of those worlds, Roland and Dean's vision, and then where it went with MGM and Jonathan and Brad and Rick. And is there anything interesting that, that sticks out to you in contrasting those worlds, or was it a hard adjustment to, you know, you talked about getting the script and learning you're, you're a bad guy now, and, but, but what kind of, what was your experience with that transition between those two visions? Um. Well, it was, it was a positive one on, on the whole, very positive on, on the whole. Um, and the hardest part of it was, uh, I suppose, not, not being on the inside of those story decisions. Not that I had any, any say in the first place, but I was in the room, you know, as, as they're talking. And then on set, as each scene played out, we would collaborate that way. So not being you know, participating in that way was probably the most difficult, but it was also the most normal and to be expected because actors usually are not in on, on that. You know, it was a gift to have been in on it with Roland and Dean in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of the differences otherwise, uh, for, for, for me the transition was fairly easy because of the cast. Right? Richard Dean Anderson was so warm and welcoming and right away immediately just took me in and uh, and even though he's so different from Kurt, he he's just a terrific actor, and he was able to take on everything that made Jack Jack, all of the best values of Jack, and everything else is sort of quirky behavioral things. Each one will bring to it, and you just uh, appreciate the di you know what what they're each bringing to it. But the core was the same, and so our relationship was the same, right? I was able to just transfer the relationship from one person directly to another, and that was really Richard Dean Anderson doing his part to reach out. He didn't make me go to him. He came to me with that relationship, uh, which was very wise. I would have reached out anyway, uh, but he didn't know me from anything, you know. And it was I, I give him a lot of credit for for you know, being proactive on that. Um, and then the rest was at first just getting used to all of the changes in the Star Wars universe, which really weren't changes, they were just expansions, right? Did I just say Star Wars? Oh. Oops. Oops. Okay, Oops. here's the big reveal, I guess. Here we well, go. There's a five second delay. You know, <laughs> since we're the better franchise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> So, uh, it was so, so yeah, so all those those uh, changes, uh, those new additions, that expansion that was happening, and I could see that uh, this was going to be a great thing for the franchise. And Dean and Roland, and I'm speculating now. I can't, I can't speak for them, uh, but they had moved on to other projects in the meantime, and uh, someone else picked up 
the Stargate world and ran with it and created all of this. So what I always knew and predicted was that eventually those differences would merge again in the future, right? And we will end up having uh, a degree of, of, of shared vision when it's all said and done. And I think we're rapidly, rapidly reaching that point, that critical mass, and especially now with Stargate Command. Um, really, really happy and proud of the, the work that these guys are doing. And then MGM, you know, really reinvesting in the franchise is a phenomenal move and, and worth it and timely and relevant. And I think this is what, what it's taking, right? Questions? Go for Number it. Two. Hey, Dougie, it's been a long time. Oh my um, God, yes. <laughs> so I just want to say welcome back to GateCon. And what were you doing down in um, Brazil? Oh, uh, well, the, I usually in the winter take off for two or three months when things slow down. And I uh, sublet my apartment and uh, get my backpack and uh, go hang down on a place called Aria de Juda in Brazil. I rent a little house, keep it simple, two cats, uh, 20 minutes to the beach and everything. <laughs> Practice my samba, stay away from real. <laughs> but I just came back from six months of traveling. I was down in South America. And uh, for the next panel, what I, I'll, I'll, uh, I was down in, uh, I flew down to Tulum last November, spent a month down there, and then Yay. flew over to Colombia. Then I walked, uh, when I was in Colombia, I decided to go to Venezuela. <laughs> How was that? Um, it was an adventure. It was old school. Okay. Uh, I, I did it because nobody else was doing it from uh, did you do Columbia. It on because, of course, a uh, dangerous thing. I'm staying with the mm -hmm. backpackers, and they were saying, no, you're crazy to do and something. And 45. Like yeah. I walked across the border with $550 in my boot because uh, there's no notes in uh, Venezuela. Shit. And uh, <laughs> I had to bribe my way to get in. Uh, I took a, a Colectivo taxi from uh, Colombia, from Rio Racha, into a place called uh, Mercabo. And for those first four hours, you have to go through all this security. And that's also where all the bandits bring back all the uh, gas, oil, and everything from uh, Venezuela back into Colombia and everything. So here you are going through all this security. You're the only gringo in the taxi. They stop you and look at you and go, okay, what do you, what's this crazy man doing here? <laughs> Get you out of the collectivo taxi, look at your passport, see it's, it's stamped, I'm okay, and then they try to size you up. Hmm. But literally, for the first four days when I was in Venezuela, I didn't have any money because you couldn't find any notes. And I had to, eventually I found somebody that, uh, at a posada, at a hotel and everything, after four days, that uh, I said, yes, I have money, but it's all in the bank because it, we're in Venezuela, and uh, what are you doing here? I said, well, nobody else is here. <laughs> and literally for one month, I used his debit card. I gave him money uh, in my $100 bills and all that, and I, he gave me his debit card, and everything had to be by debit card because there's no notes, only notes for the taxis and the buses if you're lucky, but everybody ho hoards them and everything. And uh, it was old school. I was living literally on uh, $15 a day. And I was able to stay and, and feed and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, I was the only guy there. <laughs> That's some pretty worldly wise stuff. Well done. There's sir. more stories. We'll, we'll yeah. talk later. Yeah. Peter, yes, the, what was it like having the, um, the makeup for when you, know, when you changed from being Apophis to being a very, very old man? How long did it take to keep the change to actually get you so old? Right, for the benefit of the young lady in the back. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the Serpent Song episode where Apophis' host aged from the handsome, young, dashing gentleman that he was to <laughs> virtual death, close to 100 years old, I guess. Uh, that makeup was, was bizarre because I had just recently witnessed my father's passing and when I was at my oldest in my makeup I reminded myself very much of the way my father looked 
just before he passed. So it was deep for me on that level. Um, exciting overall, because that was the only episode where I worked with the entire cast, um, Terrell Rothery included, you know, and um, as a result, that's probably one of my best memories. I'm going to keep my answer short because I know we're pushed for time and we've got a couple more questions over here. But thanks for that. Yeah, hi guys. Um, I have a question for you, Alexis, uh, since you were on the original movie. Um, Hit me. Yeah, uh, one of my favorite actors is James Bader. So I was mainly thinking, do you have any good you know, memories or fun stories about it? Memories of working with James? Yeah. Uh, well, J James was great. He was a consummate professional the whole time. Uh, can't say we got particularly close. Um, I think I was closer with some of the other cast members. Um, uh, but he was he's James, and he's just always doing a you know terrific job. He mostly kept to himself. Uh, he had a lot of really intense uh, uh, back and forth debates, bickering with Kurt uh, over politics uh, in in the makeup oh, trailer easy. every morning. I thought we're not forth, talking about forth. that anymore. <laughs> uh, so that was kind of fascinating to watch. Um, yeah. Wait, sorry, one sec. Hi. Um, as actors who play characters where death doesn't mean anything, which probably outside like the Marvel Universe and their timeline um, is pretty uncommon, what's it do from an actor's perspective to your career planning and to your <laughs> process? <laughs> well, to what's know? career planning? Okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, you could be dead today, and then three years later they call you back, I suppose, back. for a prequel or something like that. Tell us a little bit about that, um, that I, life. I liked that aspect. It's like, you know, it's, uh, yeah, so I died, but did I really, you know? You're not really Am dead. I not going to come You're back, okay. you know? For Nothing like a soap opera. Or, you know. So now we have a competition. How many outfits did Apophis wear during the course of Stargate? How many times did Apophis die during the Stargate? <laughs> One of you is going to be a winner, and I have a feeling I know who. Yeah, no kidding. Ah, the death thing. I'm also going to have yeah. a, the bindi that I wore in an episode and earrings that I wore in an episode at my table. And I'm going to be interested to see who knows uh, which episodes they came from. Ah. Here's a question a back. A trivia here. question. Excellent. I haven't asked that first question, answered that first question, and the question of, of the planning thing, and, 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 and in the case of, uh, of your question, I'll, I'll pose it to, and, and what is the old cliche, um, try and make a god laugh, and, and that's make plans, right? So that's really what our career, or at least my career, I can't speak for everyone else, but my career is to, is to not to make, make the plans, but to be ready for when they present themselves. Right on. Yeah, yeah. And speaking also to the, the death question in particular, uh, I think we have to approach it with every death is meaningful if we're doing, because our, our job is to tell the story. So every death is meaningful, even if you, the actor, knows that, this, you, yeah, yeah. that I can be coming back, even if you, the character, knows, right? So, well, you so, better die, damn it. Right, so it's like, so, you know, Chlorel could come back through the sarcophagus. He knows that he is effectively immortal, but we still have to play it as every death is meaningful because it does have some shock to the system. There is still, you know, and of course the jury's out as to what does happen past death, right? Um, nobody knows and nobody comes back to really tell us what the answer is. So it's all psychologically uh, weighty on the person every moment, and that's part of the story every single time, and whether it's painful, whether it's peaceful, that gives you another clue as to what's happening in the episode. You know, how did it come on? Was it sudden, was it not sudden? All these things make a difference. If you, if you die over and over and over and over and over again, keep coming back to life again, are you still sane? Right? All these questions. Is there a soul? All, yeah. all of these things. And so every time you play that, you're playing with a whole new set of those variables. And that, for me anyway, is super interesting and mm -hmm. fascinating. Hello, Alan. Oh, hello, Alan. Hello. Hey. How are you doing, guys? How did it feel to be on, your, on GateCon's very first uh, live stream to the world? Fantastic. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Great premiere. Yeah. Fantastic. How did we do? 
I swore, didn't I? Well done, well done. So I'd like to thank um, everyone in the audience and also everyone watching live now uh, through Stargate Command. Thank you all very much. Please thank our guests on stage. And also to everyone out there watching um, through Stargate Command. I'm sure everyone here would like to say hello to you all. Wave to the camera. And guys, don't forget to uh, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, wherever you can find us, follow us, um, and keep in touch. And yeah, for anybody who wants to special. press flesh, uh, shake my hand, I am bugging out early on Sunday morning, so please get it done before then. Thank you. Yay, Peter. Everybody, please thank our system lords. Take care. I'm, I'm sorry, system lords.